Yes. Uh, um, so, <laughs> you know, a decade I can accomplish a lot before I retire, but there aren't really any psychedelic lawyers yet. I'm probably the first one to publicly come out and, and say that I am. Um, and for good reason, mm. you know, there's really not a lot of business right now that, that um, right. attracts this. Mm -hmm. But seeing cannabis unfold over the last decade as I have, it doesn't really take a genius to figure out that the law is way behind the curve on this and lawmakers even more behind the curve. And there's no shame in trying to catch up or, heaven forbid, get ahead. So that's what I'm trying to achieve here. Mm. So I just opened up to one of your grids, um, one of your charts, page 13 here, mm. and you're running through like the um, uh, crime statistics in Arizona. Oh, yeah. yeah and I yeah. just think this is like a great, great thing to point out. Um, so 2010 cannabis arrests are around 18,000 uh, people yeah. in 2010 and in 2018, 14,600 yeah. or so. And yeah. like that's insane to me relative to other crimes like burglary and um you know robbery and even murder yeah like, well it's kind of like shockingly low murder numbers i i know I the the chart you're referring to in the book and and let me fill in mm -hmm. a little more about that because sure. when i created those charts it was for the purpose of just demonstrating that the same old tired refrain we keep hearing from the no camp on cannabis um, where they keep saying, you know, cannabis is a gateway drug and will lead to all these other crimes. So I said, fine, we have almost a decade of cannabis in Arizona now. Let's see if there is any validity whatsoever to that tired old refrain that cannabis leads to crime. Well, I'm pulling statistics directly from Arizona government. I'm not making them up. I'm not drawing them from any source other than the state itself. And the state reports that in the decade approximately that Arizona's had its cannabis program, crime went down in every major category. So, mm. you know, I'm not going to say cannabis led to crime reduction, but it does beg the question. Uh, but what I can say with comfort is that in, in the ensuing roughly decade that we've had a cannabis program in Arizona, we went from zero patients to roughly 200,000 and crime didn't spike. It went down. So, mm. So much for the naysayers on that issue. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's it's quite a complicated topic and such a tragedy um, that this whole drug war thing is still being enforced in my in my worldview, at least. Um, oh, and yeah. like a lot of uh, attorneys helped architect it. Um, like it seems like Nixon had a whole crew of folks helping. Um, oh, yeah. And it was only political. There was no mm -hmm. science or public policy behind it, in, in particular for cannabis. Um, I have quotes in the book, and you can actually find these online. Uh, in point of fact, you can go to YouTube and, and just do searches for like Nixon and cannabis. He's recorded in the Oval Office expressly saying that he just wanted to get back at, I, I kid you not, hippies and Jews. Um, right. I, I wish I were making that up. Um I think he even commented like all the psychiatrists or psychologists were Jews and that he uh, didn't understand their fondness for cannabis. Uh, yeah. So, so that's how cannabis, no joke, got on Schedule 1. They, they didn't take testimony from any scientists. They didn't take testimony from, from you know, crime uh, reporting agencies. They, they just did a political action to favor Nixon, who didn't particularly like the counterculture. Which was There's fine. Really the counterculture great... didn't particularly like him, so it was even. <laughs> right. Um, there is a really great kind of um, history I read. I think it was called The Most Dangerous Man in America. Like, um, talking, it kept flipping between Nixon and Leary. Yeah. Uh, and Nixon just really needed an enemy. Yeah. <laughs> and it was Leary. And um, it helped him with his propaganda for, I think, the war that was on at the time. And uh, yeah, just this dangerous counterculture. Like they had to, the establishment had to feel like it was the end of the world. Um, so they had to like do this and Nixon's paranoia and crazy personality definitely oh. came out. Oh yeah. The, the conservatives of that time frame. Remember they're coming out of 
the end of World War II, the 1950s, the single greatest expansion in the U.S. economy ever. Um, at one point, the, the U.S., I, I think, was something like the producer of 50% of all the world's goods. Um, mm. So, you know, we're coming out of this incredibly strong economic growth period. The people of the 1950s were strangely both um, socially conservative, but also economically conservative. You know, the economy was still sort of limping along, even though people were making tons of money. Americans were afraid to, to, to spend it. So mm. um, from that perspective, it's not really difficult to see how this counterculture of the 60s, which was so polar the opposite to the ethos of the 1950s, was so mortally threatening to them. So in the end, the lesson I take from it is this is all a study in extremes of reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, even with, even with your reference to Timothy Leary, I, I kind of cast him in that time frame as equal parts hero and villain. I mean, the fact that you and I right. are even having this conversation right now is directly because of Timothy Leary. So for that, I give him credit. And yeah. he, he did kick off this revolution in thinking. Uh, unfortunately, I think he got a little too exuberant and uh, ultimately did more harm than good. Well, I think the harm came from Nixon choosing him as the enemy more so than, you know, Leary doing his crazy thing. Yeah, but um, Leary's reaction to it was above <laughs> above and beyond. Oh, totally. He, he, he like, really I think went he got a little wild. Time. Yeah. I think he got a little wild, totally. But I'm yeah. still a hero, but kind of an anti-hero to me. Yeah, it's like don't don't do this, but also like I'm in awe. <laughs> like, yeah, it's amazing what he was. How many times did he break out of federal prison? Like three, <laughs> two, three times. Like, yeah, I well, can only hope that if I'm in federal, I can get out that many times. Yeah, I think your your phrase anti-hero is absolutely spot on. And understand, I, I have a fondness for Timothy Leary. I just, I, I don't believe in the hero worship uh, mm. that some people take to it. Yeah, totally. You know, it's, totally. If I can, if I can, it's sort of like the sure. same thing with Terrence McKenna. <laughs> Look, I, yeah. I, I love Terrence McKenna. I absolutely credit him as uh, posthumously being one of my educators. But, you know, mm -hmm. do I deify McKenna? No. Do I agree with everything he says? No. Uh, and you know, I, I see people online who start up these, you know, Terrence McKenna fan clubs and they, they just want to devour everything McKenna. That's fine. But all things in their proper proportion, please. Right. Especially when he's kind of, I like how, uh, Lorenzo Haggerty from the salon kind of puts it as, uh, Terrence is more of a bard than, than like a. Yes. Traditional philosopher or scientist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so, and Lorenzo does literally refer to him as the bard. So you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the best way to put him. Yeah. Like it, the stuff isn't necessarily factual or scientifically verified, mm -hmm. though he's quite an inspiration. Yeah. And um, yeah, we want to like, even his brother says a lot of what he said was just made up bullshit. Yeah. So, you know, how, how do we couch that? It's an interesting angle. Um, and a lot of what Lorenzo's put out, which I love, you know, had some crazy stuff from Leary, like talking about space migration and life extension and all this stuff, mm -hmm. intelligence squared, smile, you know, that thing. Um, and it's a really cool, like, um, song to march to, but it's not necessarily valid um, in the way that they thought it was going to be. Yeah. I think. And, you know. I, I do love when it gets really far out and <laughs> speculative, but I do understand we have to kind of couch it with the facts. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately. Absolutely. Pesky, stubborn facts. Um, like, have you ever read uh, the autobiography of a yogi? For sure, yeah. Okay. So so you remember the, the sections where Yogananda is talking about how he always admired these spiritual leaders, and at some point he's describing some of them, and... There's one where he's talking about uh, another yogi who was able to astrally project themselves and be yeah. in physically other places, even though, you know, their body was sure. elsewhere. So stuff like that, like when I was reading Autobiography of a Yogi, I was thinking that's really just above and beyond any level of credibility. 
but at the same token, there's a kernel of truth within it if you know what to look for. So it, it's that same critical approach to these texts that I think uh, people really need to focus on. Yeah, exactly. Like, what is that? And how do we, how do we want to couch these unbelievable things? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I'll even <laughs> use the example of astral projection because in its own way, I claim to have experienced it myself. But this is during meditation. I'm not physically going anywhere. I'm sitting in one space, but, you know, I'm, I'm hitting some higher consciousness point just through meditation. So I, I get it, but, you know, right. you know, no, I'm not, you know, physically materializing and dematerializing. Sorry, it's not Star Trek. These aren't transporters. Um, or, or like there's another reference in, in, in Yogananda's book where he refers to somebody who had their arm chopped off, uh, but it mysteriously grew back the next day. It's like, <laughs> it's like yeah, you lost me there. Sorry, I'm just, I'm not going to go with you on that trip. Right, exactly. And that's, that's what founds religions like they've got their whole kind of religion there in san diego uh, what's that called self-realization fellowship maybe oh yeah um they're actually all over the world and there's one here in phoenix they have a very oh big, didn't know that very big lovely facility right here on central avenue in phoenix mm. well i'll have to visit yeah it just got a little too like um catholic church of the yoga world for me yeah um when i was jumping in uh, otherwise, it was a really interesting group. Um, and, you know, how can you not like that book, <laughs> Autobiography of a Yogi? It's kind of, it's a tough one. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I, my approach to it, maybe I'm wrong here, was much in the same way that one would have perhaps read a Jack London novel back in the day. Because mm. it's, it's, mm. it's an exciting adventure of this guy's life. And it's, well, it's autobiographical, so there's factual stuff in there for sure right yeah i think that's a smart move that's a smart approach yeah. um and it's in that same era as check london essentially right yeah so why not um yeah and my point being like those kinds of books are what eventually form religious organizations um i want to kind of differentiate that from like a spiritual organization like a you know, Native American church where you're actually having practices. There is some sure. dogma, but you're having real deal experiences. Um, sure. And yeah, like, how do we say like, okay, you've got this baggage, like take on this baggage. Now you're part of the group. Like you've got to kind of have some sort of division there. I don't really know what that totally looks like, but it's how I kind of wrestle with that personally. Yeah. Um, and cause we can have that. We have had that with Terrence. We've had it with Leary. Um, you know, I, do you recall any kind of details around what Leary did um, in terms of forming religion, religious organizations? Yeah. Um, from memory, I couldn't hope to express this accurately, but um, Leary did make an effort to form an LSD-based religious organization. And this was in part to try to keep his studies going because he was shut down and defunded. But mm -hmm. he came across what was a smart idea, although poorly executed, which was to establish religious exemption, thereby creating a scenario in which legally your, uh, air quote, parishioners uh, could continue to participate in these substances without fear of further prosecution or mm -hmm. loss of liberty. Um the problem, though, well, there were multiple problems, but the big thing was he was trying to create this religion out of whole cloth based on LSD as a sacrament, and there had just been really no case precedential support of that. And then you look to the, the cases that came under Sherbert and you know, ultimately into the modern day with Rifra, and mm -hmm. you can see the patterns in the court really do discourage the creation of new entheogenic based religions not saying it's impossible and certainly there's nothing in the law that prohibits the creation of new religion it's absolutely okay to create new religions but when you're premising it on some sort of revelation because you took a psychedelic that's a harder sell in the courts and and as larry experienced uh not winnable 
so what can we learn from that? So there needs to be a precedent of like a long history of use or just some evidence of a history of religious mm, use? Man, I, I just had a great conversation with a religious studies professor, Brad Stoddard. In point of fact, I, over the weekend, I posted the, the interview mm. uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, and Brad and I talked about it to some extent. Um, the, the creation of the religion itself... Uh, that's the easy part, weirdly enough. It's the convincing courts and the DEA that there's some sort of an entheogenic component to a new religion. That's the hard part. Here's why. To get the exemption from DEA so that your religious organization can use these psychedelics or entheogens, you're having to go and fill out some paperwork with the DEA. You're, you're literally going to download forms from their website, which, by the way, the DEA does have a website, and they do have these forms, and you can download them. Mm. Uh, but in it, you're having to explain your, your organization's doctrine, historicity, use, etc. Now, pause for a moment and consider this. You're going to the chief drug enforcement agency in the country and saying, hey, I am asking for permission to do a thing that I'm now confessing I'm doing that is definitely <laughs> illegal. And, oh, yeah, you're the law enforcement agency, and I'm filling this out to tell you about all my illegal activities and asking you permission that I can do what I'm doing. Um, small surprise, that doesn't sell well. And it's a flaw in the mm. system. Uh, but it's the system we have, and it's a system in which I have to work as a, as a licensed attorney, and unfortunately you do as well. So that's the hard part, is, is getting the basis of a new use established and then accept it. I think that's very mm. hard to do. Now, compare and contrast that with, for example, like the Native American church with their peyote use or the ayahuasca churches that have been making inroads into the United States these past few decades. They're showing up right. to, the, to, the, to the game, if you will, with historical use already well-established and the religious organizations themselves already well-established. So they have a much easier time, and I mentioned ayahuasca a moment ago. Uh, in, in the last couple of decades, the ayahuasca churches have had a few run-ins with law enforcement uh, and yeah. prevailed uh, successfully. I mean, did really, really well in front of the courts and benefited in part because of REFRA, which is why I'm kind of encouraged by REFRA. So, well, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's so not— So have you seen anybody doing an exciting—not exciting— um, taking an approach that, that could be modeled for other other groups in terms of like uh, convincing um, these regulators? Boy, you, you asked such a great question. You don't even know. <laughs> so I've been, <laughs> I've been pondering this because I'm, I'm kind of on the lookout for it. And, and I'll share with you the, the theory that I shared with Brad during our, our interview. Um, and my theory is, is this. I think there is an argument to be made that Existing religions, in particular Christianity, Judaism, and, and by implication Islam, because they all have this uh, Abrahamic lineage that they share. Um, there may be an argument, and I'm not saying for sure that it's a winner, but I think there's still an argument there, that these religions came out of entheogenic cults and into and through their early days. I think that these entheogens continued to be used and were part of religious worship and service and sacrament. And the reason I'm saying that is primarily two texts that I recommend people read. Um, there's Allegro's book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, uh, and then yep. there's the, the Brown's book, The Psychedelic Gospels. Mm -hmm. and, and for listeners at home who aren't familiar with either of those books or what they have to say, here's, here's the short version. Allegro is a Dead Sea Scroll scholar, and uh, well, well-respected linguist when, when he was alive. And he's actually the translator of the Copper Scroll, one of the you know, original Dead Sea Scrolls that were found. Mm. And Allegro took from what he read, again, using his skills as a linguist and in his translations, and what he found was that these early Christian and Jewish sects were actually um, from these entheogenic cults, and in particular the Amanita mushroom, is at the heart of, of these cults. And then you flash forward some many, many years later, the Browns, who are still alive and, and still lecture and tour, and they publish their book, and you can get this all on Amazon. The Browns decided to take that a step further, and, and God bless them, they went church hopping through Europe and brought mm. their camera, and what they found are on these ancient 
structures that, you know, are thousand year old churches, 1500 year old churches. Um, there's psychedelic iconography all over the place. Mushrooms carved into the, the reliefs, mushrooms in the stained glass and in the paintings. How else do you explain that there? Other than this was part of some aspect of, of religious practice or belief. So you couple that with now what we're seeing in the archaeological records that, uh, like, for example, last year, uh, an archaeological journal out of Israel published a story that some scientists had taken some scrapings from a 2,300-year-old altar in the Holy Land and found cannabis residue in the scrapings. So my theory basically goes like this, that there might be enough evidence, or at least enough evidence that can be gotten if it doesn't already exist today, to make the argument that Christians, Jews, and Muslims may have a religious birthright or heritage to explore these substances because it is part of their own religion's histories. And I would hope, I can't promise, but I would hope that uh, a reviewing court, even as high as the U.S. Supreme Court, would say, okay, um, the, the observation and practice of any religion should, by its right, include all of its aspects, including the historical ones. And if there is a historical practice that includes entheogens in Christianity, and there is argument that there was, then, you know, Christians and, and Jews should be free to explore that aspect of their religion. And mm. now I couple all that with uh, a reference to the Native American church, who I have tremendous respect for, and I think they've done hugely beneficial things for the Native American community. But when you look at the Native American church practice of peyote, that's a revival. They, they didn't originate it. This peyote usage and uh, peyote as a religious sacrament predates these tribes. This goes back to like the Olmecs and the Toltecs, for goodness sake. Um, mm. And the Native American church ended up reviving that practice after the United States government had just heinously abused the tribes decade over decade over decade, you know, booting them out of their ancestral lands, making them cross into the plains and onto these reservations. And it was during reservation time that, that these uh, Native Americans came together and revived the peyote cult. And, and it's been mm -hmm. going ever since and, and has done tremendously beneficial things for their community. So there's an example right out of American history of the revival of an entheogenic practice. So I think when you couple that with these historical records, Allegro's translations, etc., you start to see a case develop. So I've kind of officially or unofficially uh, put out word that I'm, I'm looking for uh, high quality studies by, by acknowledged archaeologists and anthropologists and, you know, that sort to see if we can put together the case. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, I, I like that argument, um, but I, I would love to see that play out in court. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but but understand, and for the viewers at home who think that, you know, I'm going to run out there and go file this lawsuit for you, you need to understand. You're going through multiple layers of courts over many, many years. You're going to have to go through some kind of an actual trial with actual witnesses, and you're going to be meeting a ton of resistance. So uh, this would require significant involvement by a number of of very qualified people, and uh, I hate to bring it down to a dollars discussion, but yeah, it's going to be bloody expensive. But yeah. but look, in, in the end, um, you might open the door for almost everybody to have the religious freedom to experience this. And, and for anybody at home who feels you know, deeply invested in whatever iteration of religion they have, understand everything I'm talking about here shouldn't be taken as a threat or, or some sort of a, a slight of your religious belief or persuasion. Far from it. In point of fact, I think what I'm saying actually supports you. Um, all I'm expressing here is that if there is a historicity inside of your religion or some denomination thereof, and certain of your uh, adherents want to experience that historicity, uh, where's the harm? I, I think they should be free to do so. Right. Um, hmm. If anything, it would it would increase their bonds to the religion, not dissolve them. Right. 
Yeah, like I, I think regularly about how um, the drug war is really uh, causing people, you know, in in and outside the country to to lose faith in the country. And I think it's kind of an imperative legally for people to have these freedoms so that they don't feel like they have to break the law. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, because so many people are breaking the law now. Um that, you know, how, after how many years of breaking the law, do you just stop being interested in following the law? Um, it's a really, really wild um, thing that I, I don't know that mainstream folks are really considering. Yeah, and not not to <laughs> bash mainstream folks, but it, it, I think the average person doesn't really give this a deep think. It's just not something that crosses their radar screen. So. Mm. I don't think it's an unwillingness to think about it just so much as it's never occurred to people to think about it. And certainly it's never crossed their paths and forced them to think about it. Mm. Do you, do you think uh, in the legal profession, people are simmering on this? Like are laws creating anarchists just by being a little too prohibitive? Um, oh God. <laughs> I, Sorry I, to I, go <laughs> like kind of deep there. Yeah, but, well, you know, it's a weird angle. Well, um, sure, sure. I, you know, any prohibition, and, and be clear, laws are, by their nature, prohibitions. Uh, right. and no, and I mean that quite literally, because think about it. In, in the absence of any law, if we're talking man truly in a state of nature, then the only laws you're up against are the laws of nature, not the laws of men. And everything you and I are talking about right now are the laws of men. So, mm. you know, when, when multiple people come together and say, okay, we are going to now form a civilization, they're agreeing to compromise their natural freedoms in exchange for what they perceive is some sort of a mutual benefit. So, you know, for example, I'm just man in nature. I'm out there on my own. There are no laws governing me. Well, how long am I going to last when I'm not the apex predator and I don't have a society behind me doing things like smelting metals and giving me weapons. Um, mm. I give myself three days before something eats me. So I right. think that when people come together and form a society, there is um, a natural agreement that takes place between and amongst them that they are indeed going to sacrifice certain of these liberties, consensually and to their betterment. Or as, as Thomas Paine, I, I guess, can take credit for writing common sense, same thing. You know, you're, 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 or Rousseau with the social contract. You know, you're, you're agreeing to certain things because you're getting something better in exchange. So mm -hmm. in that sense, coming back to where we started with, you know, all laws are in some form or fashion prohibitions because they tell you things you can't do and therefore things you must do. Um, yeah, there will always be people who are aggrieved by that and gripe about it and want more freedom than, than what they perceive is presently available. Do they necessarily express the mainstream sentiment? I don't know if they necessarily express the mainstream sentiment. And sometimes well, they're right. Yeah. Sometimes they're wrong. Right. I'm sure, you know, we could kind of gripe about mainstream for a while. It's a, it's a tricky conversation because it's, yes, as we might get something better and we're protected. Yeah. There's actually like no real clear path for opting out. Yeah. Well, and this is why I, I like the fact that there are religious exemptions available. So for people mm -hmm. in a religious context, if they want to partake in some sort of entheogen, there are paths for them to do that without fear of prosecution. Right. Absolutely. Um, so what um what's happening in this legal space, uh, you know, other than... Um, new religions popping up that's that's really interesting to you. Sure. Kind of from a legal perspective. Um, okay, so right now we've got very, very rapidly, by the way, um, investors trying to push psilocybin and MDMA through the FDA to get them on the market as prescribable medications. We all know MAPS is, is a huge supporter of MDMA, uh, and they're now in phase three studies, so MDMA is almost guaranteed to come back from, from you know, <laughs> a temporary death, so to speak. Um, and right behind that is psilocybin. There, there are a number of groups right. trying to get some form of mushroom or mushroom-derived medicine on the market. So 
in that sense, that's good because we're seeing progress being made where these substances which have demonstrated benefit to human beings will at least be available to human beings again. Um, right. But equally true, there is a tremendous amount of backlash over that because people are very resentful over the fact that pharmaceutical companies are stepping in with their you know, big dollar bank accounts and their fancy lawyers and their fancy accountants and trying to basically scoop up and lock up and build this regulatory wall around these substances that people have been using freely for thousands of years. So in the same sense that people are resentful that they have to buy water, they're, they're resentful that they may have to buy these naturally occurring medicines. And, and also the fact that the medicines are being, in effect, separated from their spiritual component. Uh, there's resentment mm. about that as well. But thankfully, there are politically minded citizens who are taking steps to do something about that. So right now, because we're in election season, and, and my goodness, we're less than 30 days away now from the election, uh, the state of Oregon has a psilocybin initiative on its ballot. A bunch of citizens banded together and proposed this new psilocybin law for Oregon, which the citizens of Oregon will vote on. Uh, and if they vote favorably on this new law, it will create basically this uh, new agency in the state of Oregon that will be responsible for overseeing their psilocybin program, which mm. will, uh, you know, they'll have a two-year period in which to... Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community.